architecture is to make Python fast. The first step is to find the bottlenecks in your Python program. It is quite often the case that most of the time in a program is spent in a very few lines of code. And of course, it makes most sense to optimize these few lines of code. The first task is of course, to identify which lines are causing the slow runtime. But before we start identifying the bottlenecks in our program, first a warning, optimizing a program for speed should really be the last step in the software development process. When you first develop a software, the first thing that you should focus on is to make the software work at all. At that stage, it should at least produce some sensible output, even though there might still be mistakes in it. Then you should focus on making it right. By that, I mean that it should not contain any errors anymore and produce the correct output. And then, and only then, you should focus on making the program fast. The technique that we will be using to identify bottlenecks and hotspots in our program is called profiling. Profiling allows us to measure resources used by sections of our program. Typical resources that we are interested in measuring are, for instance, how much time does the program need to finish? This is also known as wall clock time. Also of interest is the amount of CPU time used. Note CPU time might be different from wall clock time if your program is mostly waiting for other resources like the disk or network. CPU time might also be large, much larger than wall clock time if you're running your program on multiple processors. Other resources of interest might be, in, for instance, the amount of RAM used, but also things like how much disk or network input and output you use. In this lecture though, we will mostly focus on the wall clock and CPU profiling. As a general guideline, when you perform profiling, make sure that you start with simple techniques and switch to more complex ones if needed. The most common techniques for measuring wall clock time and CPU time are the following listed by increasing complexity. First, manual timing. Second, the time it module. Both of these I will show you during this lecture. There's also more advanced timing profiling, the C profile module and line by line profiling. Both these we will cover in our interactive lecture. To work with a concrete example, let's look at the following case study. We have been given a rectangular 2D grid as shown in the image. On each grid point on this grid lattice, we store one number. We use a two-dimensional NumPy array as a data structure. We call it A and we use the index i and j to select the row and the column respectively. In addition, we have been given a function that takes in x and y coordinates and our task is to evaluate that function on every node in that grid and store the result in a NumPy array. We implement the solution of this problem in a class called grid2d. The initialization of the class, the limits of the x coordinates and the grid size, and in addition, the limits of the y coordinates and the spacing in the y direction. We then use the numpy a range function to create an array that's storing the x, each of the x coordinates and the same with all the y coordinates. The grid loop function takes in the function f that we want to evaluate on every grid point. Remember that in Python, we can pass in functions as function variab variables. The first three lines in our grid loop functions creates a, a numpy array with zeros with the, with the correct size. The next lines extracts the coordinate values as x and y. Here in the last line, we call the function f with the, with the coordinate values x and y and store the result in our numpy array a. The usage of, of our grid class is simple. First, we create a new grid specifying the x and y spacing. Then we define the function that we want to evaluate at every, at every grid point. Remember that function takes in x and y as arguments. Finally, we execute the grid loop function and get the array a with all the values as a return value. This code here is what we would like to benchmark and improve its performance if possible. The easiest way to measure out the performance is to do simple timing. The typical strategy for figuring out how much time is spent in a certain part of the code is to measure the time before the code starts and measure the time after the code is finished and then compute the difference. And that's exactly what this code here does. We use the time function from the time module to get the times before the code and after the code. We can print the runtime by simply computing the difference. I should note here that the time function measures the wall clock time. If you're specifically interested on how much CPU time was spent, you can use the clock function in the time module. So here are some guidelines 
when doing these kind of timings. First of all, if you have simple statements that require only some microseconds, it's important to put them in a loop and execute them multiple times in order to increase measurement accuracy. The second guideline is that you should make sure that the, your machine has as low load as possible. You should not render videos at the same time as running your benchmarks. Finally, in order to get accurate timings, it is advised to run the test multiple times and you should always choose the smallest time that you, that you achieved in these experiments. In our case study, there are two parts that could potentially be slow. First, the initialization of the grid 2D object might be slow since we need to allocate for the coordinate details up about the grid. Secondly, calling the grid loop function might be slow, since the user provided function must be evaluated on every grid node. First, let us time the grid 2D initialization. As you can see, I have wrapped our class constructor inside two time functions and pr print the difference at the end. When we execute it, we can see that the runtime is in the order of 10 to the power of minus four seconds. Second, let us time the grid loop function. Here I, I implemented a, a little bit more advanced setup where I repeat the timing experiment nine times and print out the runtime run for every experiment in addition to, to the shortest runtime of all experiments. We can see that the runtime is around 1.6 seconds. This tells us that the quit loop function is the bottleneck in our code. The manual timing that I have just shown you works fine, but it requires quite some boilerplate code before you can time something. Of course, Python comes with a more elegant solution to this, the time it module. The time it module provides a convenient way for measuring the CPU times of, called, of small code snippets. The usage is simple. You import the time it module and then you call the time it function with two arguments. The first one, the statement that you would like to measure and the second argument, any initial values for the variables that you use. By default, time it executes the statement one million times and returns the accumulated time. So in other words, incrementing the integer one million times took 0 0.05 seconds. Of course, executing a statement one million times might be too slow, so you might want to reduce that number. You can use the number argument to specify how often the statement should be executed. When using time it for your own user-defined function, like in the example above, you will experience that the time it produces an error. The reason is the time it creates its own namespace, which means that any variables or functions or classes it, that you have defined outside are not, not directly available in time it. In order to make them available, you need to import them in the set setup argument. Note here, since grid loop is quite a slow function, I ask time it to run this statement only once, but I also ask it to repeat the timing five times and show me the average and minimal timing. Let's try it. The return value of time it is an array with five arguments corresponding to the time that it took for each experiment. The first repeat was took the smallest amount of time with approximately 2.7 seconds. We will continue inspecting why the grid loop function is so slow in the next interactive lecture. But for now, I want to explain to you why Python is slow and different techniques on how to make it fast. Sometimes Python is criticized for being slow, especially when doing numerical compu computations, like data crunching or, no or physical simulations. Let's run an example to find out if that is actually true. We look at the same example as before, where we have a two-dimensional numpy array corresponding to the grid values on a 2D mesh, and we want to fill this numpy array with function values. We use roughly the same implementation as in the beginning of the video, where I first create the x and y coordinate arrays, then I define the function that I want to evaluate, and finally I loop over all the x and y values, evaluate the function on the corresponding coordinates, and store the result in the A array. I implemented the same problem in C, in C++, in Fortran, and some additional Python implementations with optimizations. The table show the timing results, with each row corresponding to a different version, and the second column is the normalized timing against the C and C++ version. The timing of the last row corresponds to the implementation that I have just shown you before, except that the sinus function that is called in the evaluation function is imported from the math module. The second slow, slowest version is the same implementation, but this time we use the sinus function from the numpy module. You can al already see that there's a significant speed up by changing to the numpy implementation 
of the sinus function. The second fastest version, that is only three times slower than the C function, uses vectorized evaluation of f in NumPy instead of looping over the x and y coordinates manually. What we can learn from these timings is that Python loops over arrays are extremely slow and should be avoided if they are time critical. To overcome that limitation, you can rely on NumPy vectorization, which can result in massive improvements and which can be sufficient for many applications. However, sometimes implementing a complicated algorithm with num NumPy vectorization might be cumbersome and it might be easier to actually implement a plain loop in Fortran or C or C++. And as you will learn soon, it is possible to combine Python with plain loops that are implemented in C. Where does the big difference of one time between a C implementation and a, and a normal Python implementation come from? The answer lies in the fact that Python is an interpreted language, while C is a compiled language. During this compilation process of C and C++ and Fortran, the compiler can perform a lot of optimizations that are not possible in an interpreted language like Python. Uh, the languages C, C++ and Fortran are old languages and the compilers have been developing and optimized for a long time. In addition, these languages have a very strict type system, which means that any piece of code can be very aggressively be optimized towards only one specific type. Just to give you some example, compilers can do code inlining. Code inlining means that instead of calling a function, the compiler decides to copy and paste the code within the function into the main code. The advantage of this approach is that the overhead of calling the function is removed, resulting in a faster execution time, but at the expense of a slightly larger binary. A similar concept is loop unrolling, where the compiler decides to remove a loop and instead duplicate the code within the loop as many times as the loop was supposed to be executed. Let's compare these to Python. In Python, we do not have a compiler that can perform these aggressive optimizations. Also, we do not declare the types of the variables. So for instance, functions can always be executed with any type and the interpreter needs to be prepared for this. In addition, Python doesn't do optimizations like inlining or loop unrolling. As a result, functions that only perform very simple operations, like the one down here, um, results in a lot of overhead. I will now introduce to you an extension to Python where we can implement functions like these with a runtime that are approximately the same as implemented in C.